Lenin's Testament, one of Lenin's last public dictations and where he criticizes several high-ranking members of the Central Committee of the Soviet Union, has had a great influence on the study of the history of the USSR. The most explosive part of the letter is, of course, the postscript, added a month after the original was written, and in which Lenin seems to predict the popular opinion about Stalin, warning ominously about what might happen if Stalin isn't taken out of power. Quote, Stalin is too rude, and this fault, entirely supportable in relations among us communists, becomes unsupportable in the office of general secretary. Therefore, I propose to comrades to find a way to remove Stalin from this position, and appoint to it another man who in all respects differs from Stalin only in superiority. Namely, more patient, more loyal, more polite, and more attentive to comrades, less capricious, etc. This circumstance may seem an insignificant trifle, but I think that from the point of view of preventing a split, and from a point of view of the relation between Stalin and Trotsky, which I discussed above, it is not a trifle, or it is such a trifle as may acquire a decisive significance. January 4th, 1923. To this day, Lenin's testament is a common thing used by anti-socialists, but even more often actual socialists, to decry what the Soviet Union became after Lenin passed away. As I got into learning about the USSR and began to learn about and gain more respect for Lenin, the testament was one of the main things that turned me against any interest in Stalin. After all, if even Lenin disapproved of Stalin, then surely Stalin was as bad as people say. The testament is also, of course, known for Lenin's praising of Trotsky, and is thus why Trotskyists are often fond of pointing to it. As the testament says, Comrade Trotsky is distinguished not only by outstanding ability, he is personally perhaps the most capable man in the present Central Committee. However, it is this same passage that makes basically all of Lenin's testament extremely suspect in terms of its reliability. Why? Well, because substantial evidence of the relationship prior to this letter shows that Lenin greatly disliked Trotsky. Trotsky spent his entire life contradicting Lenin, arguing with Lenin, disobeying Lenin, and basically doing everything in his power to wreck the Bolsheviks. There are dozens of quotes of Lenin basically calling Trotsky an idiot and a piece of shit for decades. And then, all of a sudden, in 1923, Trotsky is suddenly the most capable man in the Central Committee. Here is just a very incomplete example of quotes of Lenin, assembled by Bill Bland in his work The So-Called Lenin Testament, talking about Trotsky over a period of decades. In 1909, Lenin wrote that, Trotsky behaves like a despicable careerist and factionalist. He pays lip service to the party and behaves worse than any other of the factionalists. In 1910, Lenin wrote that, Trotsky distorts Bolshevism because he has never been able to form any definite views on the role of the proletariat in the Russian bourgeois revolution. Trotsky represents only his own personal vacillations and nothing more. One day Trotsky plagiarizes from the ideological stock and trade of one faction, the next day he plagiarizes that of another, and therefore declares himself to be standing above both factions. I am obliged to declare that Trotsky represents only his own faction, and enjoys a certain amount of confidence exclusively among the Ostevists and the liquidators. In 1911, Lenin wrote that the Trotskyists are more pernicious than any liquidator. The Trotskys deceive the workers. And also in 1911, he wrote that, It is impossible to argue with Trotsky on the merits of the issue, because Trotsky holds no views, whatever. In his case, the thing is to do is to expose him as a diplomat of the smallest caliber. In 1914, Lenin said, Trotsky has never yet held a firm opinion on any important question of Marxism. At the present moment, he is in the company of the Bundists and the liquidators. In 1914, he also wrote that there is much glitter and sound in Trotsky's phrases, but they are meaningless. Joking is the only way of retorting mildly to Trotsky's insufferable phrase-mongering. Trotsky is trying to disrupt the movement and cause a split, and Trotsky avoids facts and concrete references because they relentlessly refute all his angry outcries and pompous phrases. In 1916, Lenin wrote that, No matter what the subjective good intentions of Trotsky and Martov may be, their evasiveness objectively supports Russian social imperialism. 
Also in 1917, Lenin wrote, What a swine this Trotsky is. Left phrases in a block with the right. He ought to be exposed. And also, Trotsky arrived and this scoundrel at once ganged up with the right wing. That's Trotsky for you. Always true to himself. Twists, swindles, poses as a left, helps the right. In 1921, Lenin wrote that, Comrade Trotsky's theses have landed him in a mess. That part of him which is correct is not new, and what is more turns against him. That which is new is all wrong. Comrade Trotsky's political mistakes distract our party's attention from economic tasks. All his theses, his entire pamphlet, are so wrong. Finally, as late as September, just a couple of months before Lenin's testament is dated, according to a Trotskyist historian, Lenin apparently told Stalin to censor Trotsky for dereliction of duty. There is, of course, another major issue with the testament in a similar vein to Lenin's abrupt turn in favor of Trotsky as well. Lenin, who had up to this point known Stalin for almost two decades, was the same person, it is commonly historically agreed, who recommended Stalin to become general secretary in the first place in April of 1922. But six months later, all of a sudden, Lenin has apparently had a complete change of heart. Suddenly, not only Trotsky, who had gone against Lenin pretty much constantly for decades as a great fit for the post, but also, all of a sudden, Stalin is a terrible fit for the post that Lenin had only just appointed him to several months earlier. To be fair, Stalin had an argument with Lenin's wife, Nadenya Krupskaya, about meeting Lenin not long before the testament was written. Only three days before it was written, in fact. But his wife said Lenin was too ill. Therefore, Lenin might have wrote the testament in retaliation against Stalin's rudeness. Of course, Lenin, according to Daniels, didn't fully know about the argument until March of 1923, months after the testament was written, and only five days before the stroke that permanently broke Lenin. Therefore, one has to wonder whether Lenin knew about the argument before this point at all. Of course, who, then, if not Lenin, is the most likely culprit to have wrote the letter, or at least to have heavily influenced its writing? Well, Nadezhda Krupskaya seems to be the most likely candidate. She was one of the only people with close access to Lenin in the last days of his life, and she was the one that initially gave the letter to Zinoviev, one of the members of the Central Committee, to distribute, in May 1923, two months after Lenin's third stroke, when he was truly wiped out and turned into a complete mute. In other words, when Nadezhda could be completely sure that Lenin could never truly contest what had been written. Why else? Why? Why? Why wait so long until after Lenin had happened to have his third stroke to finally reveal the testament that was apparently written six whole months ago, while in the meantime Stalin continued to gain approval and power. In any case, the original document shown to the Congress of Soviets had no real effect. Then, however, a month later in June, a new document was given to Zinoviev, including the same initial letter, but with the brief proscript saying Stalin should be removed added on to it. But, again, the whole document, including the postscript, had apparently been written in December and then January. What does this mean? The letter with the postscript had already existed when Nadenya handled the letter without the postscript to Zinoviev. But, for whatever reason, she chose not to give him the postscript document until the first document had had no effect on Stalin's power. This, of course, begs the question, why wouldn't Nadenya just have given Zinoviev the full letter including the postscript from the beginning? This seems to imply that, at the very least, Nadenya added the postscript in an attempt to add more impact to the testament. But again, the whole testament, and not just the postscript, in my opinion, is called into question more than anything simply by Lenin calling Trotsky, the same Trotsky Lenin repeatedly said was incompetent and idiotic and so on, the most able member of the Central Committee. Yes, Krupskaya came into conflict with Trotsky not long after the testament was written, but her criticisms of Trotsky were always pretty mild and generous in comparison to the likes of Kamenev and Bukharin. 
And this was, of course, when Trotsky was already becoming increasingly unpopular and it would have been tantamount to career suicide to really side with him. But in 1925, she supported Kamenev and Zinoviev's ideas against Stalin in a group which did unite with Trotsky's left opposition and in which members of the group distributed Lenin's testament to others. She then rejoined Stalin's side in 1928, before again siding against Stalin in 1930. Of course, Nadezhda was never really on Stalin's side at all. Krupskaya's argument with Stalin apparently wasn't just any argument. According to Lenin's sister, Krupskaya went into a complete rage. This was clearly incredibly personal and always had been. In the end, it's more than easy enough to imagine Nadezhda crafting a letter in an attempt to remove Stalin from power and replace him with Trotsky who was really the only person who stood out in terms of his opposition to Stalin's idea at the time, before Bukharin, Kamenev, and Zinoviev later broke from Stalin themselves in 1925, well after the testament had already been written. Of course, the main response of historians like Richard Pipes and Oleg Kolchiniak is that the testament must be real because Stalin didn't contest its validity. But this is not a good argument. How was Stalin supposed to know it was faked in the first place? when he wasn't allowed to even see Lenin, thanks to Nadezhda. He didn't know any of the things we know now. Of course, even if Lenin really did have that testament dictated by someone to write word for word, even if it was not in any way adjusted or edited by anyone else after Lenin supposedly dictated it, we have to consider the circumstances at the time. Lenin's second stroke, which happened in early December, devastated his cognitive and motor abilities. He allegedly wrote the testament on the 25th, when he was not only in the low point of a devastating stroke, but completely isolated from the outside world politically, other than for his wife, who exercised a great amount of influence over him at this time. Finally, as a couple minor points, according to Stefan Kotkin, there is no stenographic typescript. If there was a recording of Lenin's dictation, you would expect there to be an original document, of a secretary taking down Lenin's thoughts in abbreviated form, as there was with many other documents that Lenin dictated. But there is none. Apparently, the letter was also not signed by Lenin, which was supposedly very common, even at that time, as he was still able to sign things with his left hand. No doctors in their logs apparently speak of Lenin dictating any testament either. And also, similar to Lenin's sudden reversal when it comes to Trotsky, his sudden reversal in late 1922 and early 1923, and his opinion on how Stalin had handled issues relating to the repression of Georgian nationalists opposed to the Transcaucasian Federation, is also very suspicious. This is a more complex topic that would probably be confusing to go too in-depth about here, but if you want to learn more about it, it's talked about in the work by Bill Bland and the citations in much more depth. In the end, with the current information at hand, it's impossible to know for sure just how valid Lenin's testament is, but I personally believe, with around maybe 70% confidence, that the testament is entirely or mostly faked, and about 90% confidence that the testament is at least partly faked, particularly the postscript.